The Jewish-Roman War of 66 to 73 AD marked a tumultuous period in ancient Judea's history. The conflict, marked by religious, political, and widespread social tensions, culminated in the devastating siege and destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman force under Titus. The war had profound demographic, cultural, and political ramifications for the Jewish population of Judea, but also for the broader Mediterranean region. While primary sources offer varying accounts of the conflict's toll, its impact on Judea's population and landscape was undeniably significant. And that's what we're here to learn about today. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's nice to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's good to see you again. As always, if you'd like to support the channel and keep me going, then you would follow the links to the Patreon. Otherwise, a like, comment, and subscribe if you feel inclined to do so also goes a long way. Now, with that out of the way, let's get on to today's video. The First Roman-Jewish War now this is kind of a part one of, of two videos about the Roman Jewish wars in general. In the next video I'll talk about the Bar Kabar revolt and the events that led up to that. But let's talk about this first and go right back to the beginning. From 37 BCE to 4 BCE. King Herod ruled Jerusalem as a vassal king appointed by the Roman Senate. Herod the Great was infamous for his ruthless tactics to secure his throne, including the execution of all potential claimants from the previous Hasmonean dynasty. Even his own wife, who hailed from that lineage. To solidify his power, Herod established a new class of nobility loyal solely to him, known as the Herodians, and appointed high priests from unrelated families. Well, there's your primer on what kind of a bloke Herod was. His reign left a legacy of economic hardship particularly among labor workers employed on his grand construction projects of which there were numerous. Well, after his death, the economy deteriorated further, leading to widespread poverty and social unrest. The lack of effective leadership exacerbated the situation, leaving the region vulnerable to riots and contributing to the conditions that would eventually spark the Great Revolt. So, with the increasing dominance of the Roman Empire in the eastern Mediterranean, the Herodian dynasty, initially semi-independent, was formally integrated into the Roman Empire in 6 AD. This transition to a Roman province heightened tensions. The natives did not like it at all, and it culminated in a Jewish uprising led by Judas of Galilee in response to the census of Quirinius. After the death of Herod the Great and the removal of Herod Archelaus from power, the Romans appointed procurators technically prefects before 41, to govern the Judeans. Initially, these Roman officials respected the Jewish customs and laws, permitting them to observe the Sabbath and granting exemptions from pagan rituals. They even minted coins without images, a departure from the practice elsewhere in the empire. During the years 7 to 26 AD, the province experienced relative calm. 
However, trouble resurfaced after 37, particularly under Emperor Caligula's reign. The underlying cause of tensions in the eastern part of the empire were admittedly multifaceted, including the influence of Greek culture, the implementation of Roman law, and the rights of Jews within the empire. Caligula harbored suspicions toward the prefect of Egypt, Aulus Avilius Flaccus, who had ties to Egyptian separatists and a history of opposing Caligula's family. So, in 38, Caligula dispatched Agrippa to Alexandria, without prior notice, to assess the situation under Flaccus. Agrippa's visit was met with a good deal of hostility from the local Greek population. Remember that they were under the rule of the Greeks at this time, who viewed him as the king of the Jews. In an attempt to appease both the Greeks and Caligula, Flaccus ordered the placement of statues of the emperor in Jewish synagogues, and just before I go on, allow me to correct myself, they were not under the rule of the Jews, because Cleopatra and Ptolemy had already been defeated, ending the Ptolemaic dynasty. I do apologize. Moving on. However, this move triggered widespread religious riots in the cities. You can't just put your statues wherever you like them. People do not like that. Don't do it. Well, the unrest had to be dealt with. So, in response to all this, Caligula removed Flaccus from his position. And he could have just had him sent away, but in true Caligula fashion, simply had him executed. In 39 AD, Agrippa accused Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, of planning rebellion with Parthian assistance. Herod Antipas confessed, leading to his exile, while Agrippa was rewarded with control over his territories. In 40 CE, the next year, tensions flared up once again in Alexandria, with riots breaking out between Jews and Greeks. Now, the Jews were accused of a grievous crime, and that crime was failing to honor the emperor, and disputes also arose in other cities like Jamnia. Now, Angered by the erection of a clay altar, Jewish protesters decided to take matters into their own hands and destroyed it themselves. In response, Caligula ordered the erection of a statue of himself in the Jewish temple of Jerusalem. This was a much greater insult than the original clay statue. However, Fearing a civil war, the governor of Syria, Publius Petronius, delayed implementing the order for nearly a year until Agrippa convinced Caligula to reverse it. In the year 46, some six years later, an uprising erupted in the Judea province, instigated by two brothers, Jacob and Simon, and this lasted for two years until 48 AD. It began as a sporadic insurgency, centered in the Galilee. Roman authorities eventually suppressed it, resulting in the execution of both brothers. The relatively conciliatory Roman policy in Judea shifted then with the appointment of Gessius Florus as procurator. That was between 64 and 66 CE. Now, Nero was at this time in power, 
and he tasked Flores with extracting a large sum of money from Jerusalem's temple, while quelling any resistance. This, of course, was not received very well by those who frequented the temple in Jerusalem, and it led to tensions. When Flores seized funds from the temples, he justified it as reclaiming unpaid taxes. This action, along with subsequent upheavals, sparked a great deal of rioting in Jerusalem. Charismatic insurgents, supported by armed bands, entered the city, igniting a period of revolt against Rome and internal conflict among different factions. Attempts to seek support from the governor of Syria, Cestius Gallus, proved to be futile intensifying the revolt and leading to the formation of various revolutionary groups. Flores's efforts to quell the riots only fueled more revolutionary fervor, escalating the conflict even further. Now, according to Josephus, he was a Jewish historian of the contemporary time, the eruption of violence in 66 AD was actually triggered by Greeks who were sacrificing birds in front of a synagogue in Caesarea. In response to this, one of the Jewish temple clerks, Eleazar ben Hanania, halted prayers and sacrifices for the Roman Emperor. Grievances over taxation were added to the protests, leading to random attacks on Roman citizens and perceived traitors in Jerusalem. And also, you didn't really have to do much to be perceived a traitor. If you weren't 100% with them, you were effectively a traitor nonetheless, even if you were just trying to keep your head down and not get executed by a Roman patrol. Now, Roman troops, under the orders of procurator Gessius Florus, breached the Jewish temple and confiscated 17 talents from its treasury, claiming that it's all right, it's for the emperor, just give us the gold. This was also not received well. Someone barging into your house and taking all of your things, not very neighborly. Therefore, this action incited further unrest, with some Jews openly mocking Florus by collecting money as if he were poor, insinuating that he was a beggar and they were throwing coins to him. Now, Florus responded by sending soldiers to raid Jerusalem and arrest several of the most prominent leaders, who were later whipped in public and crucified. All of this despite some of them actually being Roman citizens. So you can see how serious the Romans were taking this. Well, don't worry, the Judeans were taking it equally as serious, because in retaliation, the outraged Judean nationalist factions took up arms and swiftly overran the military garrison in Jerusalem. Fearing the escalating conflict, King Herod Agrippa II and his sister Berenice fled to Galilee. Judean militias targeted Roman citizens and pro-Roman officials, removing all Roman symbols from the country. The rebel faction Sicari seized the Roman garrison at Masada, capturing their fortress. Initially, the violence had stemmed from internal factional conflicts between Jews supporting the rebellion and those who opposed. But the conflict resulted in significant loss of life either way, including the former high priest Ananias. The Roman garrison on Jerusalem's western border was besieged 
and unable to aid those against the rebellion. Eventually the garrison surrendered under the command of Metilius in exchange for safe passage from the city. However, the Jewish rebels, led by Eleazar, slaughtered all surrendered soldiers, except Metilius, who was compelled to convert to Judaism, or end up like the rest of the soldiers. According to 4th century church fathers Eusebius and Epiphanius of Salamis, Jerusalem's Christian community fled to Pella before the outbreak of the war. Smart choice. Well, in response to the unrest in Judea, Cestius Gallus, the legatee of Syria, mobilized the Syrian Legion 12 Fulminata, reinforced with units from 3 Gallica, 4 Scythica, and 6 Ferrata, along with auxiliaries and allies, totaling approximately 30 to 36,000 troops, certainly a formidable force. The Syrian legion swiftly captured Narbata and Sephoris, with the latter surrendering without resistance. Judean rebels retreated to Adzimon Hill, but were defeated there after a brief siege. Advancing further, Gallus reached Acre in western Galilee, then marched on Caesarea and Jaffa, where around 8,400 people met the sword. Continuing the campaign, Gallus seized Lydda and Aphek, and clashed with Jerusalemite rebels in Geva, suffering significant losses rather, to Judean rebels led by Simon bar Giora, reinforced by volunteers from Adiabene. The Syrian legion then laid siege to Jerusalem, but inexplicably withdrew back towards the coast. On the retreat, they were ambushed and suffered a devastating defeat by Judean rebels at the Battle of Beth Haron, resulting in the loss of approximately 6,000 Roman troops and the Aquila of Legio XII Fuminata. Gallus then fled to Syria leaving his troops behind in quite a disarray. Following the victory at Beth Aron, the Judean militias, comprising various factions, attempted to expand their control to Ascalon, but failed to take the city, suffering heavy losses to the defending Roman garrison. Subsequently, the Judean provisional government was established in Jerusalem, with prominent figures like Ananas ben Ananas and Joseph ben Gurion assuming leadership roles. Meanwhile, Menahem ben Yehuda's attempt to seize control of Jerusalem was thwarted, leading to his execution and the expulsion of the Sicari faction to Masada. Simon Bargiora's faction also ousted from Jerusalem, sought refuge in Masada until the winter of 67 to 68. On the Roman side, Emperor Nero dispatched General Vespasian to quell the rebellion, who arrived with two legions, 10th Fratensis and 5th of Macedonia at Ptolemais in April 67. Joining him, were his son Titus, with Legio XV Apollinaris, and various local allies, which included King Agrippa II. Now with over 60,000 soldiers, Vespasian initiated operations with the priority of subduing Galilee. Now, here was the situation in Galilee. The Judean rebels were split into two factions, 
those loyal to the central government in Jerusalem under Josephus, representing the wealthy and priesthood classes, and local zealot militias, composed mainly of the poor, fishermen, farmers, and quite a few Syrian refugees. Several towns surrendered with minimal resistance, but others had to be taken by force. Josephus recounts detailed sieges of Tarakea, Jotapata, Gamla, while Giscala, a zealot stronghold, fell as its leaders ran away and fled to Jerusalem. By 68 CE, Jewish resistance in the north was more or less crushed, and Vespasian established his headquarters in Caesarea Marditima. He then systematically cleared the coastline, avoiding direct confrontation with the rebels in Jerusalem. According to Josephus, around 100,000 of the Judeans were killed or perhaps enslaved in the Roman conquest of Galilee. However, these numbers, especially such a great number of 100,000, are subject to quite a bit of debate. Well, after consolidating his position in Caesarea Maritima, Vespasian prepared for a new campaign in the Judean and Sumerian highlands. That's Sa-Marian, not Su-Marian, by the way. Don't get confused. Meanwhile, the Jews expelled from Galilee took refuge in Jaffa, named at that time Joppa, rebuilding the city walls and disrupting commerce and grain supply to Rome through a light flotilla. Josephus described their actions, stating, They also built themselves many great piratical ships, and turned pirates upon the seas near to Syria, Phoenicia, and Egypt. They made those seas unnavigable to all men. Leaders of the failed Northern Revolt, led by John of Giscala, retreated to Jerusalem with their forces. The city, filled with militants from various factions, including remnants of the Judean provisional government and zealot militias, descended into chaos. The radical zealots seized control, initiating a brutal civil war and executing anyone who advocated surrender. When the zealots deceived the Idumeans with a false message of reconciliation with the Roman army, approximately 20,000 armed Idumeans entered Jerusalem, joining forces with the zealots. This led to the massacre known as the Zealot Temple Siege, resulting in the deaths of prominent figures of the Judean provisional government, including Ananus ben Ananus and Joseph ben Gurion, along with thousands of civilians, of course. But no one remembers their names. Upon learning of the events in Jerusalem, Simon bar -Giora left Masada and began raiding Idumea, where he encountered little resistance and allied with the Idumean leaders, including Jacob ben Susa. In the spring of 168, Vespasian launched a systematic campaign to reclaim rebel-held strongholds in Judea. He successfully captured Afek, Lida, Javne, and Jaffa, and expanded his operations into Idumea, Perea, and eventually the Judean and Samarian highlands, where Simon Bagiora's faction posed a significant threat to Roman authority. By July 69, the Roman army had seized key strategic locations, including Gofna, Akrabata, Bel at Alfrem, 
and Hebron. Meanwhile, back in Rome, significant political upheaval on their side was very much underway. The emperor at the time, Nero, had his downfall because of his erratic and strange behavior. As the Senate, Praetorian Guard, and prominent army commanders all teamed up to conspire against him. Nero's subsequent taking of his own life marked the end of his reign, but the succession was far from stable. The new emperor was Galba, but he was swiftly murdered by his rival Otho, igniting a civil war known as the Year of the Four Emperors. In 69, Vespasian, previously uninvolved in the power struggle, was suddenly hailed as emperor by his legions. He left his son Titus to continue the campaign in Judea, while he journeyed home to claim the throne from the usurper Vitellius, who had overthrown Otho via nefarious methods. Titus led the Roman legions towards Jerusalem, the rebellious province's capital, causing a wave of Judean refugees as towns fell to the Roman forces one by one. The Judean rebels, weakened by their own internal strife, were primarily focused on their own survival and control of the city. Despite factional conflicts among the zealots, they still manage significant military strength. John, a leader of the zealot faction, seized power in Jerusalem after assassinating Eleazar, while Simon Bargiora's forces were invited into the city to counter John's faction. Infighting between the factions persisted through the year 69, further destabilizing the rebel cause as nobody could seem to get along. The siege of Jerusalem, the heavily fortified capital of the province, quickly reached a stalemate as the Roman armies found themselves unable to breach the formidable defenses. In response, they established a permanent camp just outside the city, encircling Jerusalem with a trench and constructing a wall as high as the city's own fortifications. Attempting to flee the city meant facing capture and crucifixion on the dirt wall, with as many as 500 executions occurring in a single day. Now you imagine it. You climb up that wall thinking, I'm sick of this, I'm getting out of here. And the first thing you see is not your freedom, but the hundreds of squirming and screaming unfortunates nailed up to crosses, staring back at you, begging you not to go any further. More than a little horrifying, isn't it? Well, that's how the siege was. As Romans began constructing siege ramparts, two rival zealot leaders, John of Giscala and Simon Bargiura, reluctantly joined forces to defend the city. However, their internal conflicts only persisted exacerbated by the deliberate burning of stockpiled food supplies by the zealots. This act, intended to galvanize resistance against the siege, instead simply led to widespread starvation among the defenders. Contemporary historian Tacitus, you all know him, describes the dire situation within Jerusalem noting the relentless resolve of its besieged inhabitants. Men, women, and even children alike took up arms, showing unwavering determination 
and a willingness to fight to the death rather than surrender or face expulsion from their homeland. Estimates of the besieged population vary, with Tacitus suggesting 600,000 and Josephus indicating nearly one million. This included pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem for Passover festivities, but upon arriving found themselves trapped and doomed within the besieged city. In the summer of 70 CE, the following year, after a grueling siege of seven months, Titus and his forces finally reached the walls of Jerusalem. And when they did, it led to widespread destruction of the city. The Romans strategically targeted the weakest points of the city's defences, successfully breaking through the third and second walls by the end of May. Throughout the final assault, the zealots, led by John of Giscala, fiercely defended the temple, while the Sicarii, under Simon ben Giora, held the upper city. The destruction reached its climax with the raising of the second temple, a symbol of Jewish identity and resistance, on Tisha B'Av, as the 29th or 30th of July, 70 CE. The entire city, including all three walls and its citadels, was systematically demolished, leaving few structures standing. Survivors were either taken into slavery or scattered, and the once thriving Jerusalem was reduced to a smouldering ruin, with remnants of overturned stones serving as grim reminders of its former glory. John of Giscala surrendered at the fortress of Jodapata, while Simon Bargiora was captured at the site of the destroyed temple. The precious treasures of the temple, including the menorah and the table of the bread of God's presence, were looted and paraded through the streets of Rome as spoils of war during Titus's triumphant procession. Among the captives were John of Giscala and Simon Bargiora, both of whom faced different fates. John was sentenced to life imprisonment, while Simon was executed. And if you know anything about life in a Roman prison, depending on the method of execution, perhaps you'd like to weigh up your options. However, the fall of Jerusalem did not immediately quell all resistance in Judea, as isolated pockets of insurgency persisted as late as 73. Nonetheless, the capture and destruction of Jerusalem marked the decisive end of the Jewish revolt and solidified Roman dominance in the region. This pivotal event in history was commemorated with the construction of the Arch of Titus in Rome, which immortalized the spoils of war from the sacking of Jerusalem. Now, in the following year, the spring of 71, after Titus departed for Rome, Sextus Lucilius Bassus was appointed as the new military governor, tasked with completing the pacification of Judea, leading the formidable 10th Fratensis Legion. Bassus embarked on a series of campaigns to subdue the last remaining pockets of resistance. He successfully captured Herodium, and then ventured across the Jordan River to seize the fortress of Macarius, situated on the shores of the Dead Sea. Continuing his advance, Bassus pursued and defeated a group of 3,000 Judean rebels under the leadership of Judah ben Ari in the forests of Jardus, 
located on the northern shore of the Dead Sea. However, due to an unexpected illness, Bassus was unable to fulfill his mission and passed away before its completion. He was then succeeded by Lucius Flavius Silva, who assumed command and directed his forces towards the final bastion of Judean resistance, the city of Masada. In the autumn of 72, Silva led Legio X, accompanied by auxiliary troops and thousands of Jewish prisoners, totaling 10,000 soldiers, in a determined assault on Masada. Despite his orders for surrender being rebuffed, Silva established multiple base camps and encircled the fortress with fortifications. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, when the Roman forces finally breached the walls of Masada in 73, they were met with a grim sight. The defenders, numbering 967 in total, had chosen, instead of surrender, to take their own lives. Only seven survivors, spared by chance, were found among the ruins of the citadel. The fall of Masada marked the tragic end of the Jewish revolt symbolizing the unyielding spirit of resistance against Roman domination. The Roman suppression of the Jewish revolt in Judea had profound and far-reaching consequences, particularly in terms of demographic impact and societal upheaval. The conflict, of course, resulted in widespread loss of life, as many Judeans perished in battles sieges and massacres, while numerous cities, towns and villages were razed to the ground. The extent of destruction, of course, varied across different regions, with some areas suffering more extensive devastation than others. In Galilee, for example, cities like Tarakea and Gabara were completely destroyed while others, like Sephorus and Tiberias, reached accommodation with the Romans and experienced relatively minimal harm, at least compared to the other cities who did not reach such an accommodation. Similarly, Transjordan and central Judea witnessed varying degrees of destruction. However, it was Judea proper, especially the Judean mountains, that bore the brunt of the devastation, culminating in the utter destruction of Jerusalem, where more than 90%, that's right, 9-0, of the population perished. Josephus records that many Jews were taken captive by the Romans, with some sent to work on infrastructure projects in distant lands like the Isthmus of Corinth in Greece while others were co-signed to forced labour in Egypt, or simply sold into slavery elsewhere. It's estimated that one-third of the Jewish population in Judea died during this revolt, with many succumbing to famine, disease, or violence, and another tenth being captured and subject to harsh treatment and enslavement. Well, and despite the immense loss of life and destruction of the temple, the life of the Judeans persisted. However, discontent with Roman rule, of course, continued to simmer beneath the surface, eventually erupting into the Bar Kokhba revolt of 132 to 136. This rebellion, though ultimately crushed by the Romans, further destabilized the region and contributed to the eventual depopulation of Judea proper. Now, that is for another video. Conflict is certainly far from over in Judea. 
So in the next video on this topic, that's exactly what we'll talk about. The Barack Obama revolt and the events leading up to it. I'd like to thank you for listening for today's video. And I would like to thank my Mega Chad patron, Stark Factory, for his contribution. If you would like to make your own contribution, you need only follow the links in the description and the comments to the Patreon, if you feel inclined to do so. Otherwise, enjoy the video at your own pace, and however you see fit. Thanks again for listening. And I'll see you in the next video. Good night, everyone.